attempt to remain on time. Um, this is not going to be your typical panel. Uh, normally a panel would be a series of Q&A, but what uh, each of these gentlemen have put together is a 15 minute presentation around each of the respective disciplines. Um, and then at the end of that, we will take uh, questions in each of the respective areas. What they don't know is I've actually switched it around and uh, Carl will be giving David's presentation, David will be giving <laughs> Clint's presentation. It should be quite exciting because they've never seen any of that. Uh, actually, of course, I'm kidding, but these guys didn't know that. Um, uh, what we'd like to do is get things started with uh, Carl Schmidt. Carl is the uh, A programmer at Red Relic Entertainment. He has five years of professional involvement in the game industry. But given his age, he's been involved in, the industry, in some industry prior to that. So I'll let him talk about what that is. Uh, his credits include Company of Heroes, uh, Company of Heroes Opposing Four Fronts, Dawn of War II, Dawn of War II Chaos Rising, Dawn of War II Retribution, and Space Marine. Throughout his career, he has worked in the area of UI, gameplay, tools, optimization, and rendering. Please welcome Carl Schmidt. So two guys walked into a bar. <laughs> Ouch. For those of you who didn't hear, several people actually responded to that with the correct answer, which is ouch. <laughs> okay, so as uh, Kelly introduced me, my name is Carl Schmidt. I'm a programmer at Rally Entertainment. Uh, I have been for a little while. Uh, just to preface this, these, all this is my opinion. Even though I'm using Relic theme slides, uh, it's not the opinion of THQ or Relic. Uh, so just to get that out of the way. Um, so just a, a bit more history about who I am. Uh, I started, I used the club games, as most people here probably have from a very young age. Uh, and then in high school, I started doing modding, like making maps, uh, trying to change the code, learning how to program. Hi. Oh, sure. Uh, well, that sounds better. Um, so basically, I, I was modding games like Quake 2 and Quake 3, uh, learning their tool sets and trying to learn from their source code. Uh, it was, I had made like a GoldenEye sort of Quake 2 mod. That was sort of my big claim to fame. But later on, it became more important that I did those things. Um, then I, after graduating from high school, I went to the AI, or what was used to be CDIS and now is AI Vancouver Burnaby for the game programming program. Uh, I did that for a little while, but then I dropped out and went to SFU and got a Bachelor's of Science. And then uh, as through SFU, I got a co-op placement at Relic Entertainment, which is very, very important. I'll talk about a bit more about that later. Uh, and that sort of began my professional career. Uh, I did another co-op at, Re at Relic and then uh, some contract work, and then now I work there full-time since 2009, the beginning of 2009. So just to get some like obvious stuff out of the way for game programming, I'm not going to get too technical. It's going to be more like soft skills related talk. But obviously, game programmers in more like core games, you're going to be writing in C or C++ generally. You're going to want to have knowledge with these languages. Uh, other somewhat obvious things are scripting languages. Uh, Lua, Python are very popular. Uh, designers are going to be writing some stuff in these languages. You're going to be writing tools with C Sharp and other scripting languages. Uh, being able to help designers is, is very useful. They may know how to write some stuff in these languages, but as they do more complex things, they're going to need programmer help to sort of wrangle all that functionality. They're going to try to create systems they want so they're more usable, efficient, things like that. Uh, there's like a differing opinions I've seen, especially online lately, about whether or not the, like the more trade schools are the way to go to get educated for a game development career, or a traditional degree, or some of these newer degrees. Uh, my opinion is that some schooling is good. Uh, university can be good, depending on the university, obviously. But some 
uh, groundwork is very important and some of the basics and low level things I, I like after being in the industry for a few years I think are quite important uh, I was sort of self-taught until I actually went to university and so there was a lot of stuff that I, I learned there or that I was in classes there that I obviously already knew um, wasn't new to me at all but there was a lot of low level things that were new to me and I think was very valuable so but again that's sort of my opinion on it. Um, some things that surprised me when I first got into, into the industry that like were very important and they're mentioned a little bit in some post-secondary, but they, they're maybe understated a little bit is source control management. So uh, Perforce is sort of the big commercial one that a lot of game companies use, but there's also, unfortunately, people still using CVS. Um, Subversion is still out there, and there's Git now, and Mercurial I didn't put up there, but um, there's some other software packages for doing source control. This is pretty important. These are skills that will be useful to you. You're going to learn them on the job if you didn't learn them before. Um, and it's good to kind of uh, make your mistakes with them when you're not working uh, because it sucks when you lose like a day's or a week's worth of work because you accidentally reverted your change list. And I've done that once and that wasn't fun. Uh, some other things that I, that I became like enlightened when I finally got into the industry was uh, offline asset pipelines, so these are like artists make art, art turns into like game specific data for the game to load and things like that. That's that pipeline. I wasn't, I, I was aware of it, but I didn't really understand like how complex it can get and how important it is. So uh, making like, back to like mods, like Quake 2 or Quake 3, I think if you wanted to make a level, you had a tool, you exported it. If you want to make a model, you exported it. These are all sort of like manual things you would click and do. Um, and because I guess the source code wasn't available for everything, it didn't really matter as much if like the map format changed and then I had to manually export every single map if I was making a game. Uh, like when you're in making, like in production for a game and you need to make changes like this, you don't want to say, okay, everybody, you have to open and max your model and then export it and do that for every single model in the game when you have thousands of models because we decided to change the format that the end of the game needs to use. So there's these pipelines set up where it's, it automates a lot of these things. Uh, you have to set up tools and processes to figure out dependencies. So you can export to one format and then all like a bunch of data is in that format and you have these servers that crunch through that and then end up into a different format. This, I guess this kind of a quick summary of Asset pipelines. It, it's it's used a lot in the uh, motion picture industry for like uh, computer graphics. Uh, LucasArts a few years ago unified their game and their movie pipelines so they could share assets and things like that. There's gonna be more of that in the future. I'm sure Ubisoft might be doing something like that to, with their uh, film endeavors. Um, <coughs> I'll talk quickly about. Agile development, this is sort of like project structure, project management. Well, software usually teaches the waterfall method and they may mention Agile a little bit. Uh, at Relic, we started doing Scrum in 2006 when I did my first internship there. They did their, they got these Scrum <coughs> master per people to come in and teach us this different type of project management. Just sort of, it's, as a brief summary, it's, it's a, uh, it's not planning everything right away and then like following the set path because things can change, requirements can change. And then the waterfall method sort of breaks down if you, if the, there's a lot of change constantly. So um, this is sort of just like setting smaller goals for shorter periods of time and then achieving the, those and the reviewing <coughs> what happened and then continually adapting and integrating change. It doesn't always work out perfectly, uh, but it's, it's like, it's a lot, a lot of studios is, are using now. Um, and then there's also learning, like you're, you're not going to learn everything you need to know in university or in post-secondary, you're going to be constantly learning on the job. I've recently took on a more of a graphics and rendering role at Relic and previously I didn't really have a lot of knowledge about that, so uh, I've been sort of learning on the job, but there's an enormous amount of resources available now that weren't there 15 years ago. Um, you can hear, like, well there's like stories about how the, the guys who started Linux, you know, they would they would learn things and share with their friends and it was like very like old school social networking kind of learning but now there there's like videos google 
for example, has a lot of their talks online. GDC puts videos up, so there's slides everywhere, Insomniac, Crytek, Valve, they all publish papers about different techniques they want to sort of share, and uh, there's a lot to learn from, basically. It's almost overwhelming. Um, just quickly, I'll continue about some other things I didn't know about. Well, they're sort of like well-known, but, but uh, I didn't understand the importance of like specialization. Uh, one thing I get asked, asked a lot from my uh, leads at Relic are like, what do you want to work on? And then I say, everything is interesting. So uh, that's not always the greatest answer, but you can be a generalist. That's sort of like a thing you can, a role you can take. Um, but there's people who just specialize in sound, people who specialize in optimization, people who specialize in AI, especially, there's a lot of that. Um, so you can sort of like pick something you find interesting and then continue on and, and sort of specialize in that. Uh, also, the industry is changing. I'm sure lots of talks mention this uh, throughout the conference, but there's lots of opportunities. So if you like to use ActionScript, which I don't, uh, you can be a Flash programmer. You can, uh, you can make games on Facebook, Windows 7 Mobile, iPhone. There's all sorts of opportunities. The game industry is sort of exploding horizontally in this way. Uh, there's lots of different platforms you can get and you have access to, so there's no longer these like dev kits that you can never actually get your hands on from Sony or my, Nintendo or something like that. And others, you pay $100 and you can develop right for the hardware for an iPhone. So it's uh, there's lots available, lots of choice there. Um, some quick notes on, uh, oh, actually, I'll just talk about the programming specific stuff. Yeah, like if you're doing uh, like high-end sort of spectacular games, you're going to be dealing with the problem of there's more cores, not more fast, or not faster cores. So multi-threading, things like that, you're going to need to learn. Um, it's good to learn early. You'll be more prepared for what the industry will look like for programming there. Same with memory latency, but I'm going to skip over that for now. Uh, career management is important. It's, uh, it wasn't really, I wasn't really aware of it for the first few years, but actually socializing with people, uh, like just your own peers, uh, taking advantage of things like some companies have mentorship programs within the company. So I, that's how I sort of got up to speed with some graphics stuff um, with one of our principal programmers for the last year. And just going to lunch with people, talking with other people that aren't programmers, it's very, very useful, even though it seems simple and maybe difficult. I know I have trouble with it sometimes, but uh, it's important. And the longer you're in the industry, people sort of go to different companies and eventually you know people in all sorts of companies. And I know, like now I know a person at Blizzard, and now I know a person at Crytek, and, and uh, you don't really have to do much, you just have to talk with people and make friends. Uh, some important skills, One, the top one is sort of the one that I really had no clue about, is that people are going to ask you how long it takes for you to do things. Uh, seems really simple, but I had no clue. I go to, like, I make university projects, I know had a deadline, but they didn't say, like, predict how long it'll take you to do this project. Uh, so you're going to be asked that a lot when you're, like, first day on a job, you're gonna, there's going to be, like, especially with Agile as well, you're going to have these tasks. And you're going to be asked to estimate how many hours it will take for you to do this. And that's, that can be very daunting, especially if you have like a code base of over 100,000 lines of code and you've never seen any of those lines before. Uh, it's good. At first, it'll be pretty difficult to sort of come up with these numbers. They don't always have to be super accurate, but be, uh, it's, it's a very useful thing to try to practice. Uh, problem solving is kind of obvious, uh, but... <coughs> There's lots of different ways to do this, and just by practicing writing your own code, taking open source projects and trying to fix bugs, things like that, that can be very good for your problem solving skills. Um, bug fixing and debugging, I put that as a separate thing from problem solving because debugging is sort of a specific problem solving domain. Um, in general, problem solving can be like implementing something new, but bug fixing can be a particular skill um, as well as debugging. Especially, I've ended up in the, sort of the last few months of a lot of projects, like Company of Heroes, Company of Heroes of Opposing Fronts. Um, they were sort of like, or well, the first one was quite a big project, and I was in the last few months of it. You can't make big changes. You can't refactor entire sections of code. You have to figure out how something works and figure out why it's breaking and then fix it in such a way that you're not making a whole lot of change and you're not going to introduce more bugs. Um, it's pretty important. Uh, code reviews is something that 
I've seen increase more, and this is where somebody reviews your code before you're allowed to check it in. Um, it sort of slows down the process, but it does, it is important, um, and a lot of places do it, so it's good to sort of read about what other companies, some, some like Insomniac sort of publish what they think the good practices are for doing this sort of thing. Uh, I sort of touched on it with the socializing, but working with other disciplines is very important. Like artists don't understand what we do as programmers usually, uh, or, or, pr or pr producers as well. So being able to sort of communicate across those boundaries is very important. We don't understand a lot of the artist terms and they're, they're gonna say they want certain features or certain outcomes and we have to sort of figure out what, what that means and what, that mean what we have to write to get there. Uh, and I'm gonna, well, usability and low level programming are important. I sort of talked about them before. So uh, I put together a website uh, or just like a web page that lists a lot more re resources, but I just wanted to highlight there's like an amount, immense amount of resources out there for programmers to just learn things, try things. Uh, you can make mods, there's open, open source engines, there's free engines like UDK, Unity, lots of things you can play around with. Uh, platforms like I talked about, even with the PS2, you can sort of write code for it, even though you're not really, it's not the same as when you make a game for it, but you can it's sort of practice on like a different platform. Lots of books. Um, on Twitter recently I found that I can talk to like developers all over the world and they're very happy to, to talk with me um, from like Dice and Insomniac. I get a lot of good advice from those guys. So there's, they'll, they're very open and willing to talk to anybody. I'm on, I'm on Twitter as well, I'll talk to you. Uh, developer slides are great, like slides like these ones and at GDC after GDC after GDC, there's tons and tons of slides about various like topics, anything. Uh, blogs, like there's this one that uh, started called Alt Dev Blog a Day. This is amazing. Like the mostly programmers, but other developers, every single day, a bunch of guys or like they basically assign you like this day you write an article and and so it, it rotates and, and there's lots of articles every single day about AI about anything. It's it's uh, pretty fantastic. There's also there's free tools. Uh, you can get a demo scene. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's mostly for like small graphic sort of intensive um, presentation type of software. It's uh, pretty interesting and indie sort of. And I think we're running out of time. Just want to say like this link just talks about all of the different companies in Vancouver alone. Um, and but there's also some that aren't listed there, like DES games and other Facebook games. Lots of startups. There's lots of opportunities. So. Don't think that you have to go to a big name. There's lots of uh, lots of other companies you can apply to and learn from. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Carl. Um, our next uh, our next presenter, um, David Patch. David has been involved in the computer game industry since the mid-90s. He attended California College of Arts and Crafts in San Francisco Bay Area, then landed his first job as an entry-level animator. David has served as art director on the Tron Games, The Sims, Sim City, and Lego Island. He is an art director at Ubisoft Vancouver. Please welcome David Patch. show you is the last project I was just working on. And I, it was nominated on Wednesday. It was a finalist for the best visual artist at the Computer, Gaming, uh, Computer Game Awards, and which is a great honor. But above and beyond that, when you put into this game took 16 months from let's make a Tron game to actually out the door to be up there competing against Mass Effect mm -hmm. and um, Bioshock or uh, Tom Clancy and all of those. So let me run the little trailer for you and we'll just start there. more about myself. Um, I had an Intellivision back when I was a kid. Um, played the death out of that thing until it blew up on me. And every Sunday, me and my buddies would hop on the bus, pocket full of quarters, and head to the arcade where 
I put up some of my favorites from that game, which is Kill Gunner, Rip Off, and Steel Murder. So it's like, uh, Defender, and of course, Burger Time. You can't get around Burger Time. <laughs> um, so, in all the while, I was drawing, you know, um, doing all that, the, the art stuff as well. Uh, passion for drawing, passion for painting, passion for sculpture. So, I finally went to art school. And it was in art school that I realized I can actually go make these games. Um, so, I went to a uh, now defunct little school called Computer uh, Arts Institute, or Institute of Art, or two of them. So, and I learned 3D Studio R4, like Animator Pro, learned D-Paint, all of the Deep Avalizer, all of those early, early uh, programs. Um, I went out, fi finished my reel, sent it out, <coughs> went out to a whole bunch of different studios over in, this was back in Marin County in, uh, in California. And a small company called Amazing Media picked me up. They said, okay, come on in for a second interview. This is great, we love your talents. So I went in on that Monday, you know, got the job, went in, and uh, me and a friend of mine from the same school, we were both hired, we're sitting down, got our computer set up, got all our hotkeys going, we actually started modeling that afternoon. Feeling pretty good about myself. He's like, yeah, I'm making games. I'm making art for a living. Five o'clock, the executive producer walks in and says, oh, by the way, we've run out of funding. Oh, <laughs> uh, you, we have to lay you guys off. We may have funding in a week or two, but so I went back out in the pavement and stuff like that. And sure enough, they called back in a week or two, and I went back to work with them for them. <laughs> <laughs> I was laid off probably four or five more times in the next eight months before the company finally went under, and I finally went off to Mindscape to make uh, Lake White. So with that. <coughs> These are the games that actually saw the light of day um, that, are, that have my name on them. Um, each one has a story that makes them actually really personal and interesting to me. Um, one of them, like Lego Island. Um, we were sitting there, uh, the Christiansons, who I don't know if you know this or not, but Lego is a, a private corporation owned by the Christiansons. They came over from Denmark to see what we were doing because this was the first time that Lego was actually branching out into PC games. They've been making flat plastic bricks forever and never went to the computers. So they were really concerned about what Lego would look like. So they're walking around, the executive producer and uh, uh, lead designer are leading them through a whole presentation series. At this time, I'm just working on a little bit for the, for the game, which is assembling a post office out of Lego bricks, how I think it should look. And I'm watching them go by my queue a couple times, a couple times, and each time they go by, I see a little more stress on the executive producer, a little <laughs> more worry on the designer, and finally, it's, again, it's late in the day, and I just go, you know what, I'm done with my animation. I walked up and said, excuse me, can I show you something? And the executive producer looked at me and went, okay. And they walked into my cube, I played this animation, just a bunch of bricks flying together to build a building. And Bo, per perfect thing, never changed uh, motions at all on his face. Just looked at the computer, looked back at the executive producer and says, now, this is Lego. We got down, we're going to move on. You know, like Sims 2, I was there during the whole EA spouse. He actually, the guy that uh, filed the lawsuit was on my team. So I got to have a <laughs> bunch of discussions with lawyers during that time. And then, of course, um, Tron was great because I got to actually hop off on the studio that was down here. And I think it was down on Papa Falls Creek. So each one of those is really precious to me. And uh, also learning things from these things. Like, Lego ta taught me, don't be afraid. All they're going to do is look at your stuff and say, ah, that doesn't work. But it got me the opportunity to be the art director on that project. Since two, talking about knowing what's going on in your whole department around you, knowing what's happening with your whole industry and your different company, making sure that you're aware of this. Is it going this way? Can I? Should I go? No, you know all that kind of stuff. The Frankenstein, all right, for the eyes of the monster, taught me that you can always get a job in this industry. Someone is always hiring. You may have to move. Like I came up from San Francisco up here to work on Tron, but someone is always hiring. There's always some place for you to get work and know that. You just got to be prepared to, uh, to deal with that. So now I'm going to talk about what the fundamentals are, uh, both personal, team-wise, and also cross your peers, uh, that I, I think are necessary to be, one, an artist, and two, an art director. 
So one, fundamentals. Got to know your fundamentals. Got to know your color. Got to know your composition. Got to know your color uh, uh, lighting. Those three things will probably get you through a lot of stuff. Uh, of course, and draw, 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 and draw some more. Because um, everything starts on a piece of paper with a pencil. Every idea, every concept, every, every icon, everything you can think of, someone sketched it on a little piece of paper to start with. So the easier you can get those ideas out onto paper, the better. The other thing is know your platform. What are you making this game for? Each one of those platforms comes up with its own different constraints, its own different um, boundaries, is a better way to put it. But knowing those boundaries, you can actually make a better game. You can make better decisions. True ingenuity, true creativity, true innovation comes from solving a problem within the boundaries, not just, hey, what do we make today? Um, so know, know, your, um, know your boundaries, and know what your audience is. Study art history. This will be your fallback. This will be your safety net. This will be your inspiration. Find out what all these guys did, all these women did throughout the course of history to solve the same problems that you're solving. They solved composition. They solved color. They solved lighting. And they all solved it differently. There's not one right answer. Like you see Warhol compared to Raphael. They're both solving the same problems. But they did it differently and they're both as equally as important. So you film animation. I mean, probably the best anime character ever is Charlie Chaplin. Watch his moves. How, how does his body react? He can tell a whole story without saying a word. That's what you have to do as an animator. Make sure that you convey the whole emotional set without AVO. And of course, I put HR Puppet stuff up there just because it's one of my personal favorites. And if you ever see a big stuffed animal guy walking around, they're actually still doing Sid Marty Croft. They're not doing anything new. It's just not a psychotic or not a psychedelic. Um, fashion. If you're making a character, what is a character? It's a coat hanger with clothes on it. If you don't know how to make clothes, you don't know what's important about clothing, you don't understand what are the important things about fashion, you're not going to be able to make a convincing character. And I left barbarians and warriors off this slide for a, purpose, for a reason. We all know what they look like. But if you don't know how to make an outfit or a costume, your barbarian is just going to be the next barbarian. You're not going to actually come up with something innovative because it won't be believable. And as soon as it's not believable, it's over. Your character's lost. Only well, we travel. So get out there. You know, you have to see the world. You have to understand what people do. You know, what's eat better, a picture of a street in Paris or actually walking down a street in Paris? Google's great, but Google is the game, guys. You know, you don't under, it only shows you the picture of what a cake, chocolate cake is. So you can't taste it. You don't know how it falls apart in your fingers. You don't know where it leaves in your mouth. None of those things, because it's just a picture of a cake. So if you're using Google, you'll just be making great copies of pictures, not actually great copies of games. Of course, play, play, play games, play games. I know I'm going fast, but I'm a really good one. Um, so play games, we don't ask writers not to write, we don't ask directors not to watch movies, we don't ask sports heroes not to play game. play, play, these are mine that I'm play, actually play now, and yeah, play every game, play all kinds of games, all the designs are great, you know, there's always something in each one of those designs that's actually intriguing to what they're trying to achieve. Stay current. I've got a bunch of ones that I, I keep popping into. You know, for everything from pop psychology to you know, uh, welfare to Craig Ferguson. They're all giving you insights of what's happening right now. What is the pulse of the community right now? What is the world thinking about? What's important right now? And also, there's you know agile project and waterfall and leading teams. You need to know all those things too. You have to stay on top of all of the information about what the experts are actually saying about moving teams forward and generating ideas, and generating um, camaraderie between all the different sports. And the reason you really have to stay current, games are pop art in the truest definition of the sense. 
It's popular art. Games are all about sales, bottom line. If your game doesn't sell, you don't get a chance to make another one. So you gotta get out there and you gotta make sure it hits home. Make sure that people understand what you're doing from a visual point of view that people relate to. That it, it shows what's happening now for today's consciousness. Because it's gonna be on the shelf for what? Three weeks? If it's a box? Or one of how many billions now on Xbox Live? So you gotta get out there, it's gotta ring true, it's gonna ring true right now. But it's still gonna be art. Pop art is not just throwaway art. Pop art is real. It's meaningful and great pop art lasts. So on to the team. Actually, that's the uh, city view. Um, as an art director or a lead artist, you're the coach. You're not the superstar. And I put up, so I'm American, so I put up some American things, but I can put up, put up, put up Bowman and Yezerman. Uh, same thing. I'm a, I, I play Jesus. Uh, so, you're not the guy out there scoring all the, all the goals. You're not the guy out there making the plays. You're the guy actually setting the whole vision. You're setting up the game plan. You're the guy controlling all that's going on and making sure that that superstar has every opportunity to be the superstar. That's your job. Which leads me to um, Chuck Jones. This is a, off of his uh, Chuck Redux. The quote is, I always hire animators who are better than me. This is Chuck Jones, man. And then this leads you to, you're only as good as your art team. So throw your ego out the door, hire people that you know can do the job, that can act to it. And now your peers. You gotta work with a designer. Uh, figure out what makes them tick. Figure out how to talk to them. Because they can make your life hell, or you can make the best camaraderie, this, <clears throat> this meeting of minds to be exponential. More than you could ever come up with, and more than they could ever come up with. Uh, Work with the marketing. We want to get back to, for me, art is the most important thing in a game. Art director, but no art, no design on the screen. It's a text game. No art. Marketing has nothing to show. No art. The technical director has nothing to pitch about. <laughs> <laughs> and the producer, uh, he'll find something to do. <laughs> no, just the producer. I've been in so many projects with bad or not enough production, they fail. Period. Fail. You need producers, you need production, you need to keep everyone on track. On target. So, this is my statement, this is how I get through the day. It's just art, I'll make more. Sounds flippant, kind of is, but it's also, you're going to be incredibly passionate, you're going to be right on it, you're going to be right with your art, it's going to be mean everything to you until that point when someone says, stop working on it. And then you go, okay, and you move on and make more. Or that's not making it in the game. Or, oh, by the way, the game's not coming out. No one's ever going to see this art, ever, because we're not giving you the rights to show this on your reel. You got to say, cool, I'll make more. And away you go. And the other thing, the reason there's a hydrant up there, that's what your art is when it goes out there. What happens to hydrants on street corners? <laughs> And that's going to happen. Everyone that has an idea of what art is, and they will tell you what that idea is, over and over and over again. <laughs> but, but be sure of your hybrid. If it's strong enough, if it's got the right stuff, it'll be there forever and ever. So, being an art director is one of the best gigs you can ever have. A lot of fun, working with a lot of good people, and I'm making games, I'm making fun, I'm making toys. A lot of worse things to do. And as an artist, I get to set the vision. It's my idea. That's a pretty damn good thing. Thanks, guys. Our last speaker for the uh, afternoon is Clint Forward. Clint has been in the industry for over 10 years and is currently Radical Entertainment's senior world designer. His main focus is creating a living, breathing world for Prototype 2. Before joining Radical, he was a designer at Backbone Entertainment and a lead designer at Black Box Games, where he provided design and AI scripting for NHL 2K. Please welcome Clint Forward.
faster. Fourteen minutes. 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 Fourteen minutes.
Uh, I had no idea where to start. Uh, this was probably one of the scariest moments of my life. I knew I wanted to be a designer. I didn't know how to start or what to do. Um, and then I sit there with a flashing cursor on the screen saying, you know, is this chapter one? Is this, uh, is this a book? Uh, I don't understand what happens here. Then something really amazing happened. The rest of the team, uh, which are very talented people, and they've been through tons of cycles at that point, they start helping me with things. Uh, they start doing things like, uh, let's make a wish list for this game. What do we want to do that we didn't do before? Um, how about a table of contents, which was extremely important. With those things in place, I was able to go off and uh, have lots of sleepless nights and uh, put together a, a very fat design document, which I thought uh, was good and made really thought it was good. Uh, and then we got our project ha uh, uh, completed and passed through the green light, um, which was NHL 2K for Sega Dreamcast. Uh, and that was our first game at that point. So the things I learned here, uh, and what I believe is really important was go with the flow, be ready to expect the unexpected. Uh, it's very cliche, everybody says it a million times. But no matter what game company I've worked at, or what I've been tasked to do. Um, I always come in with an idea, I'm going to be doing this, and then it's always, hey, could you do this for us, or could you do that? And no matter how many times I do this, it's always something that I've never expected. Uh, and you always have to be ready to just go ahead and do that, just jump in. Uh, use your teammates, they have skills you don't, like with the design doc, uh, they were able to help me complete that. Without those guys, uh, I'd still be sitting there with a flashing cursor, maybe at the unemployment line or something like that. Uh, Designer's not top of the food chain. I know, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> it turns out, yeah, you can get hired from a beginning role. Actually, it's, it's almost the opposite. <laughs> when, you, when you look at the whole uh, structure, you look at everybody's there, it seems like you have quite a few experienced programmers, uh, artists, and designers are sometimes uh, very close to the bottom of the food chain, but uh, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, advice to designers looking for a job. Uh, anybody's looking for one. Design job. Uh, focus on being a certain type of designer. I know that's kind of small. Uh, document designer, motion designer, and mission scripter, mission designer, mission scripter, sound designer. Uh, I know when we hire at Radical, we never look for, like I said, a general purpose designer. We're always looking for somebody to fill a, a role. Um, so just just pick one, uh, something that you really like, and, and, uh, and build yourself as that type of person. I think you'll be a lot more successful. Uh, it's okay to change career paths. I've, I've done a million and one things in design in this industry. Uh, and it's usually, I get hired for something, I end up doing something else. Uh, I got hired at Radical Lab for uh, game flow design. Uh, and I ended up quickly going towards uh, world ambience. Uh, so very different type of things. Uh, prop design and stuff like that. Uh, stay positive, goes without saying. Uh, get along with your coworkers. Uh, city is way too small. This one seems kind of silly. I don't see a lot of people actually mentioning that. I think David may be mentioning it a little bit. Uh, if you don't get along with your coworkers um, and you are looking for a new design job anywhere in the city, somebody knows you. Somebody always knows you. Uh, somebody has a friend that knows you. Uh, and they will ask these people who you are. So <laughs> that is extremely important. If you get along with everybody, uh, even if you have some troubles along the way, that will keep you working in the city. If not, you have to basically leave the city or go somewhere where people don't know you. That's the truth. Uh, over 10 years later, um, through all the trials and tribulations, I'm uh, currently working on World Ambience for Prototype 2. Um, I finally found, uh, well not finally, but I, I'm in a niche that I really enjoy right now. Uh, kind of making fish bowls. Um, watching, uh, just, just controlling pedestrians and traffic and everything outside of gameplay, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, making a world come to life. Uh, GTA's inspiring those types of games. So that's currently what I'm doing. Uh, so to get to where I am with that, I started to dissect Prototype 1. Uh, I looked at what they did well with their ambient system, which was they had a lot of pedestrians and a lot of vehicles. They did a lot of things really good, actually. Uh, but that was their main goals for Prototype 1 for their uh, ambient system, and uh, it worked really well. They had like 100 guys on the screen that you could kill and you know, to do all those types of things. Um, evaluating the limits. Uh, most pads were instance and shared animations. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what that means, but that 
basically we had a bunch of characters that were really close to uh, the player, like maybe 10 guys. Uh, everybody else was sharing animations. So if you looked in the distance, there were a lot of uh, civilians that would share the same walk and look like they're kind of marching. Uh, it was some of the limits they had to get those numbers up. Um, and they didn't interact with the environment other than you know staring, collision detection, those types of things. Uh, so those were the limits. Uh, we looked at how to improve, and then that actually answered this question and made this quite easy. Uh, we stopped instancing and sharing animation. Uh, this was actually, I, I, I maybe mentioned a few things, but there were some really good, smart people uh, that made this happen. So now everybody can play their own animation, and actually uh, it was quite impactful for us. Uh, and we started interacting with the environment with something we call smart nodes, which is similar to you would see in uh, the Sims game where there's a prop or something out there that uh, civilians can come up to, and all the information is stored on that prop so they know how to use that thing. Um, so we started doing some of that. Um, so that's basically most of my presentation. Now what I have is um, I, have a, I have a video that I recorded with uh, our video department. It's really rough. I'm flying. <laughs> A big thanks to the three gentlemen for uh, coming up here and giving you guys some insight. I believe you guys will make yourself available after the session for questions for you guys because we've only got about five minutes left. Um, a couple of uh, things that seem to stand out. One, you got to play games. Uh, I think that was kind of universal from all three of you. And regardless of your discipline, if you want to be in the games business, you better learn to play games. You better like playing games. More importantly, play games you don't like. Uh, you have to know what's good, and you have to know what's bad, and you have to be able to determine uh, the best and the worst of the industry in order to do that. You have to be able to play well in the sandbox. Um, I think that was a general theme from all three of you. You guys have to be able to work with others. You have to be sociable. You have to be patient. Uh, many of the things that you learned actually in fourth grade um, <laughs> apply directly to our industry. So it's, uh, I think that was a, a general universal thing. Uh, I think uh, another thing I heard was that you, uh, you, you have to be passionate about what you do, but you have to be flexible within your environment. Uh, so you, you, you've got to, you know, part of not just working with other people, but you've got to be flexible in, this, in the sense that if you decide to go into the games business, uh, you're in a business that is going to change whether you like it or not. I have a, a quote I've been using for years, which is, change, you can ignore it, you can resist it, or you can embrace it, but you cannot stop it. And it's been a one universal truth that I found in 25 years I've been doing it, and I, I believe you guys reflected some of that within your presentation. With that, uh, we'll open it up uh, to a very few select questions. Uh, is there a, a, a question for Kurt in regards to the programming side? How about a question for David on the art side? Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> sure. oh, oh, got one? Yeah, how important is, how, how important is it? How important is it for someone uh, who's doing art to also be able to do programming? Um, you don't have to be a good programmer, yeah. but you have to know what the limitations are. You have to understand what they're dealing with and listen to them. Um, more often than not, just talking to them about what you want to achieve, and they'll, they'll give you the parameters and the constraints that then you can design around and within. So just keep, be aware of it. And it's good to dabble. Like I, way back when, I wrote basic and COBOL and stuff like that. So at least I got a working knowledge. You know, go play with it. Go go make a Unity game really quickly. Go, go, go download it. Just have fun with it. Gotcha. Just to add to that, there is a role that in some companies they have a technical artist. So if you just happen to be interested in programming as well, like there are roles where you can sort of do both things, and you end up doing like specialized tools that artists will use with art support and things like that. And yes. Translator too. Yeah. On the flip side, for programmers, how much should they know about the art side of things? So the question is, for programmers, how much should they know about the art side of things? Uh, you don't really have to know much unless you're doing rendering and optimization and things like that. Then you sort of have, it, it, it does help to know some of the packages because you might be, you might have to write an exporter for Maya or for ES Max or something. You might do custom work for these packages, so it could be good to know these things. You can, then you can ask an artist to teach you some of these uh, pieces of software. But most of the time, it's kind of domain specific. So if you happen to specialize in that, then then it's good to know some stuff. 
One of the fundamentals of communication is to be able to articulate your ideas. Never underestimate the ability to use drawings to do that. I don't care what discipline you are in. If you can learn to draw, do it. It will help you in your communication techniques, no matter what discipline you choose for. Are there any questions for Clint on the design side? Sir? Yes. yes. So you mentioned a lot of uh, designer roles. Who does the user experience? Use the interface, the usability, all the stuff. Uh, is there a specific design for that? Yeah, yeah, we do. That was actually, uh, that's a good point. That's one I left off there. There's, and there's plenty of uh, ones that I haven't put on there, but there's front-end designers and, uh, and, and stuff like that. And, you, and usually when you find those guys, um, uh, I mean, people people go into that role, but when you find those guys and they and they like it, they seem to have long careers doing that, and that's what they are. They're now front end designers, and they, they seem to be way more successful at finding jobs than, uh, like I said, general purpose designers that really don't have any place. Yeah, there's a couple like a couple UA designer, always looking for a good one because they're very rare and they're treated very well um, once you get them because uh, it's a it's a unique. Unique human being, and it's, it, it's pretty much a mixture of an artist and a designer, and a lot of times they are actually artists uh, as well. So uh, you need to have a few of those different types of skills. Whereas, say, a uh, mission <coughs> designer may be a little more uh, technical than, than say that thing. For those of you who are seeking the ultimate holy grail of you know everyone in the movie industry wants to be a director, I think everyone enters into the games business wanting to be the lead designer. That role is extremely rare. It's uh, very difficult to get, and I think you will find for most people, it's really hard to keep. I believe on one of our projects, we went through four lead designers. Yes, so uh, be aware that, that the concept philosophically of what those roles are, often in the reality, are dramatically different. Are there any other questions? We can take probably one or two more before we break out. Yes, sir. Um, I'm doing my MBA in Toronto, so from a business, as a business here, and my question applies to all four of you, maybe. Um, what should I learn in order to cooperate more effectively with you? I mean, with the programmers, with the artists, with the designers, as a business uh, person in the industry. And what do you expect from me to do effectively? I think it may be too large of a question. Yeah, well, think. business is like, uh, what do we do? You know, like, <laughs> how do we cooperate with something like EA? Um, what, what are you actually majoring? What do you want to be? Like marketing? Do you want to actually, or accounting? Do you want to actually support us? Like project, from, I would say project management, which is more to facilitate all of you. All right. Together. So learn your discipline, get into it, understand what their problems are. If you're going to be the producer, the project manager, you've got to understand what, every, what, what we deal with on a day to day basis. What's important to each of the different disciplines. Uh, you don't have to be a great programmer or artist or designer, but you've got to know what we want. And then the other thing is how to communicate what we want outwards to all the other disciplines, to the head of the studios, to the executives, to the world at large, basically, uh, depending on which studio you're with, the role changes. Um, and the other thing you need to learn is how to make us maintain our schedule. <laughs> we will keep, I will keep working on art until someone tells me not to. And it's you, a, could, you could also ask Katrina Archer, she's a yeah. PM right there standing. Big, big job for project manager is removing everybody's barriers yeah. to doing their work. So if there's a problem, I'm in charge of figuring out who is the best person to remove that problem from the playing field completely. And reminding people, you know, that's due tomorrow. <laughs> Make sure it gets tomorrow kind of thing. You it's, promised it yeah. yesterday. If you, if, you choose, <laughs> if you choose to go into management and games business, you have to realize no matter how good you are, you're still the bad guy. Um, <laughs> I, mean that, I mean that actually in a good way because your job is actually uh, across multiple fronts. You better be an excellent communicator. And when I mean a communicator, that means that you are able to walk into a room, you are able to identify the influencers who are the public influencers, and you are able to identify who are the quiet influencers of that room. You must be able to listen. You must be able to articulate ideas that do not belong to you. You must be able to do it with passion and enthusiasm. You must be able to convince the world that what you are working on is worth every dime that they are spending. And not only that, you must then turn around and convince your team that you just convinced the world that it's worth every dime you're spending. <laughs> you've got to keep doing that and maintain your credibility as both an individual and as a professional within the organization. It's a balancing act. 
do not underestimate the challenges associated with that. Many people think that the uh, producer position is the next holy grail position. Uh, I, I uh, have been doing this business for 25 years, and there are days where, you know, fortunately for me, I still have hair. I just <laughs> lost it in other places. Yeah. With that, I think we will call the meeting. <laughs> We got a half an hour break. I believe the coffee is ready. We are going to have the final session at 3:45. Please join us for that. Thanks, guys. Have a great afternoon.